Federal Republic of Austria. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question one, Ian Gray. To ask the First Minister what engagements she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ian Gray. Presiding officer, it's the end of term, uh, and we sometimes reach for a little levity, uh, and I'm famous for levity. So, <laughs> so I was tempted to ask the First Minister what she's doing to save the macaroni pie, but I would never get four bites out of that. Or, or, there's, or there's the oil and gas report, slipped out half an hour ago on the last day of term. Nothing funny about the figures contained in that. But it is also the end of school term, and all over Scotland, careful childcare arrangements made by families are coming to a crashing halt. I think that in a modern 21st century country like Scotland, Parents should expect affordable, accessible, high-quality childcare all year round for children of all ages. Can the First Minister explain why we don't have that? First Minister. OK, well, there's a, a clutch of issues to be going on with. Let me firstly deal with the important matter of the macaroni pie. Um, I, I do think that can't uh, be left to the sidelines today. I, I, I've got a confession to make. I am not uh, a lover of the macaroni pie. However, <laughs> however, my father, my father is, and I got a stern talking to on the telephone last night from my father who told me that he expected me to join the campaign to save the macaroni pie. So I've always been an obedient and loyal daughter and this occasion is no different. Um, second point raised uh, by Ian Gray, uh, the oil and gas bulletin was actually published two hours ago. Perhaps Ian Gray is a slow reader, I don't know. Um, he certainly not done much for his reputation for levity uh, today. But let me turn to uh, what I think is a serious and important issue raised by Ian Gray today. And can I start by welcoming uh, very warmly the report that's been published today by the Commission for Child Care Reform. The government will certainly be studying that report very carefully. And if there are ideas or suggestions in it that we think are worth taking forward, then we will certainly do so. Uh, but this government has, as Ingrid is aware, already increased by almost half the number of hours of free early learning and childcare that are available to three and four year olds. We have plans in the next parliament to double that provision again from 16 hours a week to 30 hours a week. Uh, but yes, I accept there are issues about flexibility, there are issues about uh, wraparound care. That's why the recent legislation that we passed put an onus on local authorities to consult parents about those precise issues. So we will continue to work hard to improve the provision of childcare. Why will we do that, presiding officer? Because it's right for children and it's also right for parents who want to work. And I would just say finally in passing, that the commitment we've made to 30 hours a week over the life of the next parliament, if we are re-elected, is way in excess of what Labour promised at the UK election, eh, or indeed what the Tories promised at the UK election. So we'll continue to lead, not just by example, but by practice and getting on with the job. Ian Gray. <clears throat> well, presiding officer, when it comes to levity, I know I'm a stand-in, but we should probably both admit that neither of us are stand-ups, that's for sure. Um, the, the, trouble with the, the trouble with the free nursery hours, the trouble with the free nursery hours, is of course that thousands of parents can't access their childcare entitlement. And the first minister knows that. She's met the Fair Funding for Kids campaign twice, but she's done nothing to fix that problem. But there is a bigger problem. The Commission reports today, and it says that we have seen a focus on early learning for preschool children at the expense of broader childcare provision. Indeed, the head of the Childcare Alliance says, in Scotland in 2015, far too many families are finding that, instead of working for them, the childcare settlement is making their lives more difficult and less secure. Uh, the First Minister may welcome the report, but in many ways it is damning of her childcare policy. Is she listening? But more importantly, Will she act? First Minister. Well, firstly, I would suggest to Ian Gray, uh, just uh, by way of an introductory comment here to my answer, that before he criticises uh, the commitment or the provision by this government to childcare, he should simply reflect on the fact that what we are providing today 
is double what we inherited from the last Labour administration. So I don't, I don't suggest that there is not work to do, and we are committed to doing it, uh, but it is far in advance of anything the last Labour government managed to introduce themselves. And I think in the spirit of honesty and self-reflection that shone through that BBC documentary, The Fall of Labour, the other night, I think they should perhaps reflect on their own record. But let me turn to the issue, because I, 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 know, I, I know this is an issue for parents. Uh, I've spoken to parents in my own constituency. I've spoken to fair funding for our kids. I would suggest to Ian Gray that he familiarises himself with the Children and Young People Act, uh, which has done uh, two things in particular that is relevant to this question. It put on local authorities the obligation to consult about flexibility with parents, but also uh, the obligation to consult with parents on early learning and childcare beyond the mandatory hours and of on out-of-school care so that that can be better integrated with mandatory early learning and childcare. So we will continue to take forward this important programme of work and perhaps Labour might want to support us instead of just throwing brickbats from the sideline as has become their want. Ian Gray. I do understand that the Scottish Government have asked local government to consult parents, but the, the Childcare Commission have spent 15 months consulting parents and providers, and parents are not going to say anything different. Look, let me try and explain. Presiding officer, after 16 years, this chamber is full of grandparents, including you and me. Uh, but in Scotland, more grandparents have to fill childcare gaps for free than anywhere else in the UK. And today is the very day Grannies and grandpas are mobilised to fill the school holiday hole in childcare provision right across the, the country. That plus friends, neighbours, juggling family holidays, flexible hours if you're allowed them, holiday clubs if you can afford them. No amount of free preschool hours helps this. And what the report says is that that is squeezing other wraparound care out. The only thing... The only thing which will help is modern, flexible, all year round, all age affordable childcare. So will the First Minister change her childcare focus and deliver what parents actually need, not what our government has decided they should get? First Minister. In, in everything I have said, I have recognised the challenges that parents face. That is why we are working to improve the provision of childcare. Uh, to do so by extending the number of hours uh, during term time, I accept, but also looking at how we integrate that better with more wraparound care. And the obligation that is now on local authorities to look at flexibility, to look at that integration, is resulting in local authorities uh, starting to consider different ways of providing childcare. I was talking to a local authority uh, nursery head teacher just a few weeks ago who's looking actively at how they extend their provision uh, longer into the holiday period. So these uh, are issues that are actively being taken forward. Now, Ian Gray wants to make comparisons with the rest of the UK. I will point out that Scotland, uh, albeit that childcare is expensive, we understand that, but Scotland has got lower costs for almost all types of childcare than the rest of the UK. Costs are rising more slowly, but there is no doubt that childcare is expensive. That's why we'll continue to go on with the job of improving it. And, you know, Labour should reflect on the fact that if they had all the answers, then why didn't they implement some of those answers when they were in government? And secondly, why didn't just... Order! Why didn't they... Mr Simpson. Why didn't they just a month or so ago at the UK general election propose any of these ideas that Ian Gray is putting forward. So, you know, I'll leave Labour to moan on the sidelines. As First Minister of this government, we'll get on with the job of improving childcare for children and parents across the country. Ian Gray. The First Minister dismisses the cost of childcare in a, in a sentence. Look, the truth is... Order... The truth is that we have some of the highest childcare costs in the world. In the world. Childcare is not working for families, but it's failing low income families in particular for them. This is not an inconvenience. It is a year round, insurmountable barrier to getting into work and out of hardship. They know what they need. They need after school clubs holiday childcare, full-time nursery, nursery places which are available, 
accessible and affordable. They need to know that childcare will not cost them more than 10% of their income, and that is Scottish Labour's commitment as well as the Child Care Commission <laughs> report. And that... And they need to know that child care won't disappear when their child is five Order. on the first of every July. I know the First Minister can't deliver that by tomorrow, but she can commit to it today. After eight years of SNP government, is that really too much for parents to ask? First Minister. I think... I think one of the problems for Ian Gray here is that he might not want to listen to the answers that I'm given because they get in the way of his pre-prepared script uh, for the questions. But people out there, I, I, I assume, will be listening to the answers that I'm given. And firstly, I did not dismiss concerns about the cost of childcare. I said explicitly that childcare is too expensive. I simply corrected a point he made about UK comparisons. And secondly, I have said that this for this Scottish Government is a work in progress. We are, yes, increasing the provision of free childcare so that it doesn't cost any percentage of a family's budget. They get the same hours of childcare uh, free of charge as primary school children spend in primary school. But secondly, I've also said that we are working to deal with that issue of integration and wraparound care. So this is a job that we are getting on with doing because I know how much it matters to parents, to grandparents, and perhaps most importantly of all, to children across the country. So yet again, we have the divide in this chamber. The opposition just raise the moans and the whinges and the problems. This government gets on with finding the solutions and doing the hard work of fixing things. Question two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. I have no plans in the near future. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week, the Federation of Small Business reported that one of every three of its members worry that they can't recruit enough skilled staff to grow their business. It's one of their biggest concerns and now outweighs tax, utility costs or access to finance. We know that this government has decimated Scotland's colleges, the bedrocks of skills training. And the excuse has always been that they would make up for the cuts to part-time places with an increase in full-time ones. So can I ask the First Minister, in the last five years, how many part-time places has she cut and how many full-time replacements have there been? First Minister. You know, Ruth Davidson, if she is serious about this point of making sure that our small businesses and indeed our businesses of any size have access to the skilled labour they need, then she would be supporting the college reform programme. Because that college reform programme is precisely about making sure that young people or people of any age going through our college system are coming out of that college system with the skills, with the training and with the qualifications that better equip them for the jobs market. And the other point I would make to Ruth Davidson about this, the issue about skills is an important one and the Scottish Government, both uh, Angela Constance, Rosanna Cunningham as the Fair Work Secretary, uh, the Deputy First Minister as Finance Secretary, work closely with businesses and with business organisations to make sure we can deal with skill shortages where they exist. But of course, any issue of skill shortages arises from the fact that we've got rising employment in Scotland. We've got falling rates of economic inactivity. So these are challenges that, yes, we must address, but they are challenges from a recovering economy. So I will continue to make sure that this government, through our education system, is equipping young people for the jobs that are out there for them. And if Ruth Davidson was serious about this, she'd get behind that. Ruth Davidson. It wasn't a hard question, Presiding Officer. I only asked for two numbers. But I'm not surprised that those specific numbers are ones that the First Minister didn't want to give. Because for the five years to 2013-14, this government has cut 150,000 part-time places and replaced them with just 9,000 full-time ones. That's a ratio of 15 to 1. And part-time courses help carers, they help single mothers, they help those returning from maternity leave, and they help part-time workers. But it's worse than that, presiding officer. Order. For the first time, we now know Order. what those cuts mean for individual communities. Because yesterday, MSPs were told that there's been a cut of more than 18 
1,000 college places in Fife, nearly 20,000 across Aberdeenshire, here in Edinburgh, a drop of nearly 16,000, and most shamefully of all, in the First Minister's own backyard, more than 30 thousand fewer college places for the young people of Glasgow than when this SNP government came to office. We already knew that the numbers had been cut, but we now know that the communities have been hit hardest by these cuts. And we also know that our small businesses are increasingly worried about a skills gap opening up. The SNP's approach to colleges is failing students I need a question, and Ms. failing David, Scotland's sir. business. What will the First Minister do to turn it around? First Minister... But well, you see, if everything was as disastrous as Ruth Davidson is making out, then presumably Scotland wouldn't right now have the lowest levels of youth unemployment that we've seen in six years and the highest levels of female employment than we've seen ever in Scotland. That's the reality of the reform. And let me, let me, just, remind, let me just remind Ruth Davidson of some facts that she may find inconvenient. Uh, we promised as a government that we would maintain 116,000 full-time college places. Now, as I accepted a couple of weeks ago to Kezia Dugdale, we didn't quite deliver on that commitment. Instead, we have delivered 119,636 full-time college places. The number of women studying full-time courses has increased by 15 per cent. We've got more recognised qualifications being achieved, 14,000 more students successfully completing full-time courses, leading to recognised qualifications and was the case in 2009. And here's the view of somebody that we all respect, uh, somebody that the opposition are usually keen to quote when his words suit their purposes, Sir Ian Wood. Colleges have come on immensely. They are re-energised and are reinventing themselves as larger units with greater potential. They are recognising their opportunity to enhance the focus on employability of students. Yes, yes, where, where part-time uh, courses are still appropriate, we support them. That's why we've invested, invested this, you won't like this either, we've in, invested an additional 6.6 .6 million in 2014-15 for part-time places often favoured by women. So again, we're getting on with the job of making sure we've got a young population that is equipped to take up the jobs that are being created in our economy. It's the kind of thing Tories used to support until they seem to have completely lost their way. This is the question, Stuart Stevenson. I believe the First Minister will be aware of the loss by Young Seafood of probably the biggest fish processing contract in the UK, affecting jobs in Fraserburgh and indeed in Grimsby as well. Um, the Council in Aberdeenshire have indicated they will work to mitigate the effects of this and the Chief Executive has indicated to me that he will give every support to government initiatives. It would be very welcome if the First Minister can indicate that the government will support every effort to mitigate the effects of job losses in Fraserburgh. First Minister. Uh, well, I certainly share the member's concern about recent developments in respect of Young's seafood and the potential impact that this might have on employees, on their families and, of course, on the surrounding areas. Uh, I can confirm that the Minister for Business and, indeed, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs uh, have and will continue to offer immediate support to the company. Scottish Enterprise is also in contact with the company to support the business and to discuss what can be done to minimise any negative impact on jobs. Of course, in the unfortunate event of job losses, we We've already made the offer of support through our PACE initiative, which helps in redundancy situations and helps uh, those who are affected by uh, redundancy. So I can reassure the member that the government will do everything within our power to help the company through this difficult time. Sandra White. Thank you very much, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the deportation of the City of Glasgow uh, student Majid Ali to Pakistan, where his whereabouts are unknown and has not been heard from since. Can I ask, therefore, if the First Minister shares my concerns over his safety, and will the Scottish Government endeavour to find out exactly what's happened to Majid Ali? First Minister. Well, I certainly share the member's concern and that of Mr Ali's friends about his safety since his removal from the UK. It's very worrying 
that nobody has heard from him more than two weeks since he left the UK. The Minister for Europe and International Development wrote to the Home Secretary on the 10th of June seeking urgent clarification on Mr Ali's situation and assurances about his safety to date. No reply has been received and I uh, now intend to write to the Prime Minister. Although asylum is a reserved matter, the Scottish Government is clear that all claims for asylum must be thoroughly and fairly assessed and that people must only be returned to their countries of origin if their safety can be guaranteed. Question three, Alice McInnes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the finding by the Scottish Centre for Crime and Justice Research that in 2014-15, Police Scotland's use of stop and search remained unduly high. First Minister. Well, I think, firstly, it's important to set the report in context. It says that, and I quote, at national level, the trends seem encouraging. In 2014-15, the overall number of recorded searches fell by 34%. Alice McInnes will be aware that the Justice Secretary has set up an independent advisory group chaired by John Scott QC to examine the use of stop and search in Scotland and this group which has met twice already will make its recommendations by August and the Justice Secretary looks forward to working constructively with members to take forward the group's recommendations. In addition to that, Police Scotland is now implementing a detailed improvement plan on stop and search which will result in better training, data recording and governance. Alice McInnes. I thank the First Minister for her response. Well, search numbers may be down, but they are still far too high. People in Glasgow are five times more likely to be stopped and searched than people in London. Searches fall disproportionately on young people. Last year, the number of searches on 16-year-olds in Glasgow was greater than the total number of 16-year-olds in that city. I know the FM wants to wait for her advisory group, but the independent review of the Fife pilot says consensual stop and search should cease now. Will she back this academic's recommendation and call on Police Scotland today to put an end to this discredited practice? First Minister. Well, firstly, as the member will be aware, there is already a presumption against consensual stop and search and there's no consensual stop and search for young people. Um, I do think it's important to wait for the outcome of the advisory group, otherwise there would be little point in establishing the advisory group. But I do think Alison McInnes, who uh, I'll, I'll pay tribute to her, I think has a very consistent record on these issues and I respect her views on this. But as I, I'm sure she will, I think she should recognise the trends that this report sets out. In the first two full years of Police Scotland, the number of searches has fallen by almost 38% and by 34% in the uh, most recent year, the number of consensual searches has fallen by 40%. Uh, the number of searches on 16-year-olds has fallen by 39%. And of course, as I said, uh, there is a, an end already to consensual stop and search for under 12s and that presumption against it for everyone else. I think the right things have been done. There's a determination to learn the right lessons, but it is important now to give the advisory group the opportunity to do their job and then all of us collectively can take forward their recommendations. Ken McIntosh. Thank you, President Officer. Is the First Minister aware of figures from Police Scotland uh, published uh, or given to me last week which revealed that there were 7,500 stop and searches in East Renfrewshire last year alone? That's more than 20 every day. Does she believe... Uh, the reason I ask the question is a young man who was stopped several times in his car and once just recently out walking, all without foundation. Does she believe that all of those 7,500 searches in the most law-abiding area in Scotland are intelligence-led and does she share my concern this is damaging, potentially damaging relations between the police and our young people? First Minister. Well, I, I do believe, and I think I've made this view clear, that that relationship between the police and our young people is a vitally important one. And the approach to stop and search, amongst many other things, will be one of the factors that helps to ensure that that relationship is a good one. But I also know from experience in my own constituency uh, that people want to see the police being visible and tackling crime and, and disorder in communities. So, of course, there is always an important balance to be struck. But again, I'd say to Ken McIntosh, uh, the same as I have just said to Alison McInnes, the trends around stop and search are very, very clear and they are all downward. The statistics that I read out to Alison McInnes are uh, important and I think quite significant statistics, significant drops in the use of stop and search and of course now uh, an end to consensual stop and search of under 12s and a presumption against consensual stop and searches for everybody else so that the, the presumption is that it is only where there are statutory grounds that stops and searches happen. I think that's the right approach and if the advisory group, as I expect it will, makes recommendations about further changes to policy then we'll take those recommendations forward. Question four, Stuart McMillan.
Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what analysis the Scottish Government will make of the impact on food bank usage as a result of Scotland's share of the further £12 billion in welfare reductions announced by the UK Government. First Minister. Well, we continue to be very concerned about the rising demand for food banks. Uh, the Scottish Government has invested nearly £300 million uh, from 2013-14 to this year to mitigate the worst impacts of the UK Government's welfare cuts. That includes a million pounds specifically for our emergency food action plan to help combat food poverty in Scotland. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that the UK Government welfare cuts have led to the dramatic increase that we've seen in food bank use. And of course, we've yet to hear the details of where and on whom the Conservatives 12 billion welfare acts in the future will fall. But as we've seen from past experience, uh, Tory benefit cuts tend to fall on the most vulnerable and disproportionately on disabled people and on women. So this government will continue to do everything we can do to mitigate that impact. Chair McMillan. I am, but information published this morning uh, highlights, that the, of the, highlights the high level of child poverty even before the additional £12 billion of welfare cuts uh, come from Westminster. Does the First Minister agree with me that these extra cuts will only push more children and their families into positions of poverty that the Conservative Government will be responsible for and that the pressures placed upon food banks and food share organisations will only increase at a time when the level of emergency food across the UK provided by the Trussell Trust food banks in Scotland was the second highest in the entire UK. First Minister. Well, I do agree with that. Uh, figures that have been published this morning show that poverty in Scotland, particularly child poverty in Scotland, remains far too high. And of course, we know that there's been an eight-fold increase, an eight-fold increase in emergency food aid given to families over a three-year period. So that does suggest that there's a real pressure on family incomes due to welfare cuts uh, and benefit changes. Now, the Prime Minister seemed to indicate on Monday that tax credits would form a key element of their proposed £12 billion cuts further cuts to the welfare budget. You know, tax credits are a vital support for many low-income families, particularly families with children. Cuts of that magnitude will have a significant impact on families and poverty levels in this country and will push more people into relying on services like food banks. So I think that, along with many other things, presiding officer, it powerfully illustrates why the powers over social security should be in the hands of the Scottish Parliament, not in the hands of a Tory government at Westminster. Question five, Neil Findlay. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the concerns expressed by trade unions and others regarding the budget reductions that local authorities are facing. First Minister. Well, the outcome of the 2011 spending review and the budget review 2013 confirmed that local government's revenue funding and capital share would be maintained on a like-for-like -like basis with extra money being made available for new duties. Despite the significant cuts imposed on this Parliament's budget by Westminster, the total share of the Scottish Government's budget allocated to local government, excluding health spending, has risen on a like-for-like -like basis since we took office in 2007. The impact of the 2015 UK spending review on the Scottish budget, as well as the financial settlement the Scottish Government in turn reaches with local government, will of course determine future budgets. Neil Findlay. Since this Government came to power, 50,000 people have lost their jobs in councils across Scotland, the equivalent of the entire engineering sector. And the poorest communities are suffering the greatest loss of services. Libraries have closed, home care has been privatised, education services cut, and the costs of burials are up. If these job losses had occurred in the whisky or bioscience sectors, there would rightly be a national outcry. There would be calls for action and a yes, task force set up in response. Why does the crisis of employment and local government not merit a similar or indeed any response from the First Minister? First Minister. Well, you know, not for the first time, Neil Finlay seems to live in a parallel universe. You know, I can't help thinking, I can't help thinking if only UK Labour had had the guts to stand up against Tory austerity, we might not have another Tory government looking to impose more austerity. Order. Instead, we have the pitiful, pitiful sight. Order. I know they don't like it. Instead, we have the pitiful sight of a UK Labour leadership contest being dominated by the question of whether they're going to admit to spending too much during the good years. 
We will continue to stand up against Tory austerity. We will continue to do everything we can to protect our vital public services, like the National Health Service and like Order. the government. But while Scottish Labour still take the view that it is better to allow our finances to be run by a Tory government at Westminster than to be run by this government here in Scotland, they will have absolutely zero credibility on these issues. Order, question six. Cameron Buchanan. Mr Buchanan. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government's approach to regulation and licensing of the taxi market is focused on the best, what is the best interests of consumers. First Minister. Well, the principal reason for licensing taxis and private hire cars is to ensure the safety of passengers. That's why, uh, through the Air Weapons and Licensing Bill, we're seeking to tighten up regulation and enforcement as well as bring greater consistency between the taxi and private hire regimes. We've undertaken a thorough process of consultation and engagement to arrive at what I think is a balanced package of measures. And these include allowing local licensing authorities to test private hire car drivers and to limit private hire car numbers where there is over provision. The bill also creates the role of a civic licensing standards officer, which will provide support and reassurance to the public, as well as being an invaluable addition to the existing existing enforcement arrangements. Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. I thank the First Minister for her reply, but does she consider that consumer protection for passengers of private hire vehicles can be achieved through customer awareness as well as background checks of drivers, whilst First preference Minister. for local knowledge or satellite navigation should be left for the consumers to decide for themselves? First Minister. Well, I, I think the proposals that we have put forward to strengthen enforcement and to change the licensing regime are important, and I think they are right. Uh, but where I, I will agree with Cameron Buchanan is I think there is a role for customer awareness as well in this area as in any other areas. We want uh, customers to be as educated and aware as possible so that they can make informed decisions about the services they use. So, yes, I agree with that, but I think the legislative provisions that we are proposing are the right ones. Thank you. That ends First Minister's question. I have... Order. Order. I'll take Dr Simpson first, Mr Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In answer to a question by Richard Baker, Jamie Hepburn, Minister for Mental Health, said the number of places for children uh, and adolescents for mental health services had increased. Uh, but in answer to a question to me last year, the government said that there would be 48 beds in 2015. On transfer from York Hill to Southern General, the beds have been cut. There are now only 42 beds in Scotland against what Labour planned in 2006, which was, which was 56. Will she afford the Minister an opportunity to correct the record at an early opportunity? As Dr Simpson Wells knows that the presiding officers are not responsible for the answers that are given, Mr Kelly. Thank you, presiding officer. I wish to make a, a point of order in relation to the publication of the oil and gas bulletin. Uh, this bulletin has been asked for for months across the chamber uh, and has now been released. Order, let me hear, Mr Kelly. And has now been released in the last day of the session. It's got profound why. implications for the Scottish economy with projected North Sea oil tax receipts at £40 billion less than, than the White Paper. I note, I note that the, I note that the First Minister said that the publication was made two hours ago. That is not a coincidence because it was published after the deadline Order. for lodging of emergency questions. <laughs> this, this Thank you, Mr Kelly. Order. Order. Thank you. I get the point, Mr Kelly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Kelly. I have your point of order. Can I say that the publication timing of uh, the oil and gas report is not a matter for me as presiding officer. It is a matter for the government. First Minister, is there something you wish to say? I, I wish to respond to the point of order, presiding officer. The oil and gas bulletin. Uh, First Minister. Published. First Minister, no. Um, it's not for the First Minister to respond to Prime of Order. It's for me. That ends First Minister's questions. We are now moving to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.